Thanks, everybody. Well, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the director and star of what has to be one of the roughest, hardest, toughest movies to come out this year. Tim Sutton's Donnybrook, based on the Frank Bill novel. It tracks a group of broken down psychopaths in the heartland as they make their way to the Donnybrook, a bare knuckle fight competition in a cage. Yes. Let's take a look. to a man has got to know how to fight. It's how you fight is all that counts at the Donnie Brook. Hot still, 100,000? Yes, sir. If I win, then it's more money we ever dreamed of and we're free. Take a last look. I'm going to buy us a house somewhere else. And give us a new start. What if you lose? Lose. Angus is a devil, man. What are you gonna do with that? What do you think? I think the whole world's going to hell. I saw you at the bar. I knew you were going to the Donnybrook, thought we could pair up. You're as strong as I come, huh? I'm as strong as they come. As you are. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the Everybody, please welcome Marga Qualley and writer-director Tim Sutton. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this beautiful, uh, destructive, tough, rough movie with incredible performances and insane bravery on the part of your, your cast. I mean, I think specifically you, Margaret, have to do some pretty wild things in this movie that uh, I don't think I've ever seen an actress be do. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, Tim, what made you want to adapt this book uh, into, into a film? Uh, well, it, it was given to me by a, a producer, David Lancaster, who's done Drive and did Nightcrawler and did American History X and these movies that are like on the fringe of American darkness. And I, I really liked all those movies. And the book, you know, I, it was like crime fiction. It was like Jim Thompson on meth. And it was just a, a book I had never read anything like before. And at the same time, I'm from upstate New York. I, it's not my world, but, like, I knew people like, like some of the characters in the book, like people who were really struggling in ways uh, financially, emotionally, uh, geographically, everything. And so I, I thought, you know, giving this book kind of like a soulful film adaptation would be worthwhile. Well, did you think that, how did you think that that would translate to the screen? Because the book is apparently remarkably violent. And the movie, while violent as well, does have that soul. Did you think that it would be difficult to translate a soul from the book to, to screen? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the book makes the movie look like When Harry Met Sally. So it's definitely, which is, you know, I, the movie is definitely... Uh, uh, Not When Harry Met Sally. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I, the, the way I complete with an orgasm. <laughs> there, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, it, it's, it, I added the kids. That, that's what I think ad makes the soul of the movie is the, the, the kids, the family aspect of it. The fact that Jarhead is not just doing it for money, he's doing it for money to save his family and to save his children's soul. And I think that sets it up. Uh, there's real stakes, there's real loss. And, and, and the book, you know, didn't have, 
didn't need that the way that I think the movie does. And Margo, what attracted you to be to play in this character? Because this character is not necessarily sympathetic, though you are able to make her that at a certain point in the movie. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess. I, I, get, I don't know. I have a tendency to read things differently than how people see them, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> like, I, I think it ended up being kind of darker than, than, I, than I even imagined it or that it felt while we were making it. Um, just because my conversations with Tim, he doesn't, you know, look at characters as being black and white. He, 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 it was really important, I think, to both of us that Delia was very hopeful and optimistic and... Um, and I think one of the exciting things about this script in particular to me was that it was just, what, it was like 93 pages or something, um, which me, it was short, you know, it's really short and gives you guys opportunity to kind of play within the text. And, and um, I think, you know, Tim's someone who's really not results oriented. He's really um, interested in what happens in between, which is really exciting. That's true. There are so many moments, I think, between uh, you and, F and, and Frank that feel like actors finding something in the moment and finding something on set. And they may have been scripted, and I don't mean that in any way as a negative. Those are my favorite moments when I'm watching a movie where it feels like a sense of you, like the director, are, are discovering something. Um, I think specifically of the shot of you sort of getting close to Frank and he um, spits in your face. Um, I know that's not funny, <laughs> saying it out loud. Um, that may have been scripted, but there was something about that that felt so spontaneous and like you guys were working through things on set. Was that what the shoot was like with each other? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, it was scripted, um, but... Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways that it could have happened, and, and um, Tim really encouraged taking different routes and, and and playing and and just kind of seeing where it goes, which is fun. Yeah, I mean, be, be, it, it a lot of it is scripted, but it's 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 what happens between action and cut. I have nothing to do with. It's completely the actor's world. It's their it's their relationship. It's their location. It's it's their lives. And so I can set something up, but the best thing that can happen is that they take that on a left turn or they explode it into something else or they sleep on it or whatever they do, they humanize it. And, and you know, bringing a script to life, I think, is, is, is a false thought. It's a, that's not what filmmakers do. What they do is they write a script to get people to understand what they want to do in the film. But the film has to be the thing that's living, and that's all up to the actors. So you see the script as the blue as the blueprint, rather than someone like a Cohen Brothers who write very specific. They are cons like adapting their script very precisely. The Cohen Brothers are masters, Agreed. and so yeah. they can do that. I, as a as a filmmaker who's still kind of like growing and finding his way, I I think that it's it's really great to that I can write and that I can write pretty good dialogue and I can write you know a, a, a narrative arc. But it's more exciting to see it come to life through the collaboration. Yeah. Margaret, is that when you talked to Tim, was that something that he said that the shoot was going to be like, and was that something that excited you? Yeah, absolutely. And and um, I think also just his overwhelming sensitivity, you know, um, about all the scenes that you mentioned that were kind of gnarly. <laughs> um, and uh, so he made a really safe environment that. Um, despite the fact that it's really heavy subject material, it was actually one of the most fun shoots of my life. Like, we had a blast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, um, you know, specifically the scene with Pat Healy, I'm not going to give away anything. If people watch it, which they will, and then they come back and watch this interview, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, how do you make a scene like that work? How do you feel comfortable? I mean, when you read that on the page, did you get excited by that idea that you're going to do something so gnarly? Or were you kind of like, okay, explain to me how this is going to go because I'm worried about this? Um, I don't know. I think I kind of had a, a, a sort of blasé approach about it. <laughs> I um, <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I guess I <clears throat> grew up dancing and just didn't think it would be that big of a deal. Just thought it would be. I don't know. I just wasn't too afraid of it. But it turns out it's kind of yeah. <laughs> it was my first <clears throat> sex scene, and I get. I, I guess 
I get it's why first people. Sex scene too. <laughs> Both of you have like a praying mantis first sex scene. Yeah, I understand why people say that they're you know kind of traumatic, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I will say that that the 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 important things with those scene that that particular scene to me, there's two things. One is that the way that Margaret and I, I mainly Margaret, but with my help, like created the character that there was this person who is a lost soul. There's this person who, who is in need and has no emotional output. She's, she's downtrodden, she's beaten, she's, she's really, really in a tough, tough position every day of her life. And so she's searching and she needs love. And I think what we tried to do with the scene, even though it comes across as very brutal and very extreme, it's also a love scene. There are moments in there where it's pure connection between the two characters, that they're giggling, that they're, they're seeing eye to eye, that there's something beautiful there. And I think that that's because, you know, Margaret's character is, is, exper is trying to experience love and she doesn't know how to do that. This is the only way she does. Yeah, I took her as a person who's hunting for a place to put her empathy, but is not, has, has no outlet for that. So that makes sense has no experience and so she's kind of still putting it in the wrong places and doesn't and it's sort of consistently butting up against the brutality and the vulgarity of the life that she's actually stuck in. So you have that moment and then you have the moment where you're sitting with someone and even the way that you address uh, Jamie Bell's character when we first meet him, it's somewhat demeaning but it seems at the same time you're also asking him a question about his life and how he's doing. Yeah. Was that something that you were thinking about when you read the script, that you were thinking about this person's soft side, how, how she's empathetic, even though she is a killer? Yeah, gosh. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I just didn't... <laughs> I think there's something wrong with me. I thought of, I think I think of her as a very sweet, beautiful person um, that's just in a really bad situation and doing everything she can to get out. And um, you know, I think she really gravitates towards Jamie's character because, despite the fact that he's also doing some pretty horrible things, he you know, he has a really good heart and he's doing it for the right reasons, doing it to try to save his family. And I think another uh, kind of noteworthy thing is that. You know, there's a lot of violence in this film. Um, and I think it's interesting because it, in no way does it glorify any of the violence. There's you know? nothing cool about the violence. No, there's nothing no. cool about the violence. And, and you know, th at the end of this movie, the big fight that, the, that everybody's, that, you know, the whole movie's building towards, you know, both players lose. So I, I think that's something that's really great is that um, it's an example of, it taps into how how angry people are, and I think you know when people are angry, when people are insecure, and they don't feel heard or seen, your instinct sometimes is to be combative, and um, and this definitely delves in t into that, and 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 how um, and how people tend to fight each other when they don't understand each other, and um, neither party comes out comes out very well so yeah how do you construct a movie that's building towards like one fight from the beginning and then still make it a satisfying experience as a viewer which you do while at the same time giving us a kind of anticlimactic fight i thought it was brilliant mm -hmm. the final fight in the way that it you know we're building and we're building and you find a way to undercut that and be like i'm not going to give you that because that would make the violence in this movie violence well, I, I wanted, the most important thing with the fight is that I wanted it to feel real. And I didn't want it to feel um, staged or martial arts based or, or even, even cinematic in a way. I, uh, the research that I did was not through movies or, 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 any, or boxing or anything. It was, it was YouTube videos of Russian gangs fighting. And it's just 20 on 20 out in the middle of the woods, and they just get closer and closer to each other, and then all of a sudden... That's on YouTube? Yeah, it's the scariest stuff you've ever seen. Okay. And, and, and it, they become one. They become one tornado of a figure together, just, just going after each other. And I said to the stunt coordinators and to the producers, if, if it feels like this, then the, the film will succeed. If it doesn't, it, the film will fail. So the whole point was to make it, to undercut it in a way that made it just super, super real, brutal, fast, and then over. And and what are you left standing with, you know? But those are on YouTube, because I'm, I'm booking the rest of my afternoon. Yeah, yeah okay. go, just Google Russian gang videos. Oh Thanks. my God, this is scary.
Uh, Margaret, you uh, have a couple other things going on right now. It's crazy. You're extremely busy. You're doing the Ryan Murphy show, Fosse, Fosse Verndon, with Sam Rockwell and Michelle Williams. I imagine your dance background plays really well into that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, well, I don't know if it plays well, but I was really excited about it because of that. I, um, you know, growing up a dancer, there's only <clears throat> so many dance movies out there and all that jazz was definitely one of them which Bob Fosse directed and it's like loosely based on his life and uh, one of the characters in that movie is Anne Reiking who was uh, the character I'm playing in this show so I you know felt like idolized these people growing up and having the opportunity to be a part of a project that you know or to play someone who is one of my heroes is crazy and scary but um really 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 cool i imagine your dance background was how you got involved with that spike jones video that that you were in which is sort of like almost like a sequel to his christopher walken dance video it's oh, so wonderful nice. <laughs> yeah is that did is that is that how that happened did he did he know that you had a dance background um i, I don't know i think they auditioned girls that that danced a little bit and i just auditioned and how long was that shoot uh, I think three three nights or four nights. Wow. I would have thought that it was much longer than that. It's so polished and put together. Um, and I have to ask, because I think anybody who comes on this stage who is in this movie, I have to get what I can from them. But you are in Quentin Tarantino's new movie, Once Upon a Time yeah. in Hollywood, which is uh, with Leo and, and Brad Pitt. Crazy. What's that like? So nuts. <laughs> I mean, I had such a blast working on it. Um, it was, yeah a crazy experience for me. It was really... How was uh, QT? How was working with Quentin Tarantino? The nicest guy. Just, you know, he it shows up on set every morning like it's um, Christmas and he's just so excited to be there and everyone was so lovely and, yeah, I feel really, really lucky. I mean, it must be such a different experience shooting... I mean, this movie is such a singular vision um, and I would say that Quentin Tarantino has a very singular vision as well, but the amount of resources that someone can get for a, sing for a singular vision is vastly different between, I feel like, the, you and Quentin. What is it like to watch a director work with the tools at their disposal on something like Donnybrook versus the tools at their disposal when you have a $100 million studio movie behind you? It's just a... <laughs> I wish. It's, it's, a, it's a different pace. I guess is the biggest thing, you know, like every day we're fighting to get our days and you have a really limited amount of takes, but there's something beautiful about that. That's something um, motivating about the energy that you have to have to, you know, you got to kind of get it. And um, Quentin obviously has a lot more time and, you know, would close down the like, 405 and the 101 and <laughs> it's so crazy. Um that was trippy. Um, you can see it in your eyes. Too. That would be amazing. <laughs> it, it would be amazing, but I, I, I will say that I mean, if you asked Quentin Tarantino, I bet he would say the same thing. The, the film is in the frame. Yeah. It's, and the frame is a camera that anyone can hold. And I think in, in essence, it's what you, what's in your frame and, and the textures in your frame and the personalities in your frame, uh, whether it's a $5 movie or a $500 million movie. And, and, I mean, it's great to be able to experience all those, all the different levels. But in essence, it's all—all all you should be doing is looking in the frame, the fr and not outside of it. The frame of Donnybrook is uh, it's, the cinematography is beautiful. And it's also really, really dark, and it really—it has that quality of kind of like it feels like light is just pouring out of darkness a little bit when there is light, and people are kind of tra trapped in 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 sort of in in dark textures around them what did what kind of conversations did you have with your cinematographer beforehand what movies were you were you looking at uh the david angaro is the cinematographer he's a french cinematographer who also recently shot another fight movie right yes sure. a prayer before dawn <laughs> yeah. um and he's he can he also did frank mary shelley i mean he, a big period piece like he's he's a very talented guy um we looked at sicario mm -hmm. we looked at apocalypse now and i also looked at uh badlands just because it, very much about the journey, those last two movies. Um, and, and as far as like lighting and, and that kind of stuff, the movie is it, it, through a dark landscape and ends in a cage. Yeah. So it has to go from, you know, not, not necessarily a sense of light, but a sense of, of vastness, a sense of la the landscape until you're, you're in a cage with fire in the background and, and that's all. You're like in a furnace. 
Um, I think we have some time for questions from the audience. We have a couple questions. Who has a question? Right here. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, this is a question for both of you, if there was a sequence or a scene that um, you were nervous to film before, this is a very intense movie, or you were particularly excited for? Um, we talked about a couple of them. Yeah, I think I should have been more nervous about that one Pat Yuli scene, but I wasn't actually that nervous. He's also <laughs> a very nice guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's real nice, and Tim just makes everything feel very safe, so... Um, that was, you know, um, uh, uh, the water was really cold. That's the honest truth. That's the thing I was most nervous about. The water was freezing. Yeah, the, the river scene is, is both very risky and at the same time, like, very, like somewhat dangerous. <laughs> um, risky as an artist, but for Margaret, but also dangerous literally as a human being because the water was very cold and the, it was actually moving quite quickly. But, the, you know, you, you look at that scene when you do see the movie and you see that scene, and it's that one moment in the movie that, that there's, she's just cleansed herself, and it, we had to have it. I Meanwhile, I'm I mean? underwater, like, okay, try to try and stay alive. Face so that when you stand up, you don't look cold. <laughs> but I was really looking forward to that, and it scared me to death, you know, much more than the fighting. Like, the fighting, it was like, I relied on a lot of people. Um, coordinators and and camera people and grips and electrics and production designers. This was literally like Margaret in the river. It was all up to her, and um, and it was it, it's an amazing thing what she did. Tim, your last film prior to this was about a mass shooter. Yay! And I think this is about um, people living on the fringes of America and sort of desperate to survive. Um, what attracts you to these aspects of America right now? Well, I, I think we live in dark times. And I've always, you know, I, I became a cinema lover th looking at movies that were mirrors to their time and reflections of their time. Um, listen, I love a rom-com as much as anybody. Um, and, and I love a Western. But I think what's coming out of me right now is, is something that's just trying to speak, uh, shine a small light on a certain corner of our country because that's what the cinema is supposed to do. It's supposed to entertain, but it's also, it's supposed to make you think and it's supposed to make you grapple with ideas. And, and, and I think both these films, I think all of my films thus far ha have that power. And that, that's why I got into it. I mean, I, I definitely want to make money. I definitely want to close down the 101. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I just, I just want to, I just want to make, I just want to make movies, you know, yeah. movies that matter. Um, Margaret, I mean, speaking of movies that matter, you just got back from Sundance where you had a movie uh, adapted of, of Native, Native Son. You adapted the book Native Son. Um, can you tell us anything about it? Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, it's an adaptation of Richard Wright's Native Son, but Susan Larry Parks did the contemporary version, um, and Rashid Johnson directed it, and Ashton Sander started in it. Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting film because... Um, it's really nuanced and it doesn't pander to the audience at all. And it, it, it just, um, it's a really complicated way to discuss, you know, classism and racism and um, topics that were obviously relevant in the 40s when the novel was written and unfortunately are still very relevant today. Um, and I think Rashid, you know, made it in a way that's really tender and complicated and subtle. Um, so I think it's a really interesting film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more question from our audience. What do we have? Hi. Um, I was curious with this movie having a lot to do with being shockingly violent, uh, what it's like making a movie for a society that has become increasingly desensitized to violence in like the last 20 years? What's that like making a movie for that kind of audience? I think that's a really great question. Um, my movie previous to this was about the threat of violence, an unseen violence that never happens. Um, this, with this, I wanted to, if I was gonna continue to talk about violence, I wanted to go all in and make it as brutal and as awful as it possibly could be. Um, I, I, I think these are real people. That's the thing, it's like, the Donnybrook is, is imagined, it's fiction, but these are real people, it's about survival, and, it's, and, and I think that's 
what I wanted to show is violence being done by real people to real people and how that feels because I think it's, I think it's authentic and I think if you see that, um, maybe it will, it, it will just make you think, it will make you wonder what it's like for certain people in the world. Um, you know, when I see movies where the Brooklyn Bridge is destroyed by robots, it's just like, I don't, I, I, I feel like that's, we're watching the destruction of entire cities purely for entertainment. This film is not just for entertainment. It, it's, to, it's, to, it's to sit with you f for a long time and make you think about w what violence is and what are the people's lives like who are experiencing it. I often wonder what desensitizes us more to violence when we watch so a filmmaker who's committed to depicting actual brutality or when we watch escapist fantasies that do destroy a whole city. I, I mean, I... I think there, it's a billion dollar industry. One is a billion dollar industry, and the other is, is being overshadowed because it's challenging, quote unquote. And I think we have to reassess that. We have to reassess what's challenging and, and why is it challenging and why should, what's wrong with challenge versus escapist and, and violence just as pure entertainment. Yeah. Did you ever have any hesitation when you were making this film to make the violence more escapist? Because I think, um, even if you set out with an aesthetic or you set out with um, an ideology, just the economics of movie making, the temptation of how a story is nor often often told or always told can be uh, can be pretty hard to push against. No. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, well, I also had support. Like the people in the movie wanted to make this. We all wanted to make the same movie. And David Lancaster, the producer, Stephanie Wilcox, the producer. We all wanted to make the same movie. And 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 that movie is. Listen, there is an aspect of folk tale to it. There is an aspect of kind of. Um, there's an operatic aspect to it. But the most important thing is we weren't going to talk down to the people who are in this movie, and we were going to try and show a. You know. What, what brutality does to the landscape and to the people in that landscape. And, and I think that's what we executed. I mean, for better, for listen, I love this movie. It is, it's not easy, but uh, I think it's rewarding and I, I, I think it means something. And at the end of the day, 30 years from now, you're gonna pick up this movie and you're gonna say, that was then, that was definitely then. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. We'll see what 30 years from now looks like. Uh, yeah, I'll be closing down the 101, hopefully. <laughs> Or it will be destroyed. We don't know. Yeah. yeah that's what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, guys, uh, I love the film. Uh, congratulations. It opens today. People can see it, right? Uh, everybody give a huge round of applause for Margaret and Tim. Thank Go see you. Connie Brooke.